Mail stands for God Mail. Hallelujah. Tell your neighbors, say, this is about prayer. Tell them, say, this is about prayer. You guys ready for some word? <laughs> I'm starting this new series. I don't want you to put a time date on it. I don't know how long we're going to do it. There's a lot of stuff in the Bible about prayer. Uh, prayer is probably one of the most boring teachings in the Bible. Come on, I'm going to be honest with you. Just be honest. People have struggled. They struggle to do it. They struggle to pray. Um, it seems like the, one of the most religious things you could ever do. But the Bible says what you pray in secret, God will reward openly. He said, don't be like the Pharisees. That's the religious people who said they pray out in public and they pray wordy prayers because they want people to be impressed. I'm never impressed with the prayers that go, Almighty, wise thou is God, and then they start talking in King James English. I don't talk like that. Sometimes I think God is looking down at us and saying, what? I say words like help. I say words like I need you. That's what I say. I, that's the way I pray. I pray real prayers. And... Um, Matt started this off for me last week, Pastor Matt. Are we grateful for him and what he does? <laughs> and the system that we have down pat uh, is that he and I, we go over notes and share them so that uh, in the instances where I, I have to be gone, uh, there is no breaking in the continuity of the teaching flow that we're, we're teaching the same thing. He'll teach it the Matt way. And I've told him to do that. I said, don't get up there and be Ron because you'll flop if you do that. you got to be you. So we take the information, run it through our own meals, and, and we bring it to you. I'm really excited about this because um, I sense revival. Um, revival is when the church gets life breathed into them again. And revival usually comes on the heels of people that know how to pray. I told everybody last week on uh, our East Coast brothers and sisters, I told them, I said, I'm just going to cut to the chase. I said, the only thing I got to do to get you to pray is for you to get your prayers answered. If you start getting your prayers answered, I'll never have to teach another prayer series. I'll never have to do a prayer conference. We'll never have to do a prayer night. You'll pray all the time. God has shown me some things in the last couple of years. Walk with me here. I'm, I'm going to preach in just a second, but I'm laying groundwork. That heaven is a courtroom. I didn't discover this till after 30 years of studying. Just God just uncovered it. It was there the whole time. I just didn't see it. That when you pray, you are entering a legal place. A court is all about legalities. A court is where there is struggle over the law. A court has a judge. Your Bible says that God is your mighty wise judge. I'm gonna teach on this about, probably about six more messages into it. I'm gonna go into it in depth. In every courtroom, there's a lawyer. The Bible says that Jesus is your advocate, your lawyer, the only mediator, the only lawyer between God and man. So you can't even talk straight to God unless you go through Jesus. He's your defender. The Bible calls Satan the accuser of the brethren. So the enemy searches your life for everything conduct-wise conduct and behavioral where you don't line up. And then he stands before God, the Bible says, and accuses you day and night. That means the prosecution. So I want you to know Satan is standing before God telling God why you don't deserve to be blessed. Why you don't deserve to be healed. Your marriage don't deserve to be alive and you don't deserve to be delivered from fear. He goes to and fro, the Bible says, and that word to and fro means literally a gatherer of information. He walks the earth and gathers information and stands in the face of God prosecuting. But Jesus is your lawyer. The Bible says that the blood testifies. So Jesus will call up the first witness and the witness on your behalf is the blood of Jesus. 
And immediately when the blood begins testifying, the accuser of the brethren has nothing else to accuse you from because it's all under the blood. Oh, y'all ain't hear what I'm saying. The Bible talks about the great, great cloud of witnesses. Those are the saints of God that have gone on before us that witness on our behalf in the courtrooms of God. When I discovered that when I am praying, I'm entering legal territory, my prayers started getting answered. Like I had to be careful what I would ask for. I'm standing up here telling you that God answers prayers. I don't, I don't motivate myself to get up in front of you. What you get, this, this spice, this passion you get from me is an overflow of my personal relationship with God. I don't have my private life and my preaching life. This right here, I just take what he's doing Monday through Saturday and just spill it all over you by the time I get here on Sunday. That's the way I preach. So it used to be when I first got saved, now this is the religious part of it, okay? The religious part of it is when I get saved, I don't know why religious people do this. No, when people don't teach the word, they just tell you to do things. Well, now that you've been saved, you need to start praying. Okay. They don't tell me why. They don't tell me how. I just need to do it. You need to be a tither. Okay, you don't tell me why. What is it doing? What's the reason behind it? What I do? You need to start reading your Bible, why? What? They just tell you to do things. So I remember, I'm like, all right, I'm saved. I was, I was a freshman in college. So I went in my dorm room. I closed the door one day after my class was over. I said, all right, I got to pray. And they tell me, you got to pray one hour. That's a pretty high standard for a guy who's never prayed. And so I go in there and I got my clock. And I literally lay on the floor and have this little pillow and I lay on the floor. And I'm not kidding. I remember I asked God to bless everybody I knew in my life. And I look back up at my clock, about six minutes had passed. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know how this hour thing works. Now, I have to, I have to find a way to disengage. Because I can stay in the presence of God for hours. But it comes with knowing what's happening while that prayer is going on. This is not religious behavior. It's powerful, powerful, powerful what happens in this relationship with God we know as prayer. Let me read this right here. 1 Samuel 16, verse six through 13, and then I'll get started right here. Y'all with me? Can I have about 25, 30 minutes? You good? <laughs> believe God gonna do something great in your life this week? Wave at me if you believe that. You gotta live that way. People that don't expect anything rarely get anything. This is Samuel. Samuel is the prophet of God. A prophet is supposed to have insight. A prophet is supposed to see the unseen. They're supposed to be able to see into the invisible and come back and speak it. So here's God's man, Samuel, wonderful man, raised in the temple under the, under the priest Eli, trained upright. And Saul is Israel's first king. God never wanted Israel to have a king. Israel begged for one. We want a king, we want a king, we want a king, we want a king. They wanted to be like all the other nations that had a king. God didn't want them to be like that. God wanted them to be a theocracy, a God ruled people, not a king ruled people. But they weren't having it. They wanted to be like all the other nations. So be careful what you're asking for, God might give it to you. So Saul was their first king. Saul did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He was disobedient to God. And God said, you are no longer my anointed. And he went on and he took Samuel on a hunt to anoint the next king over Israel. So it was when they came, this was Samuel. He came into Jesse's house and he looked at Eliab. These are Jesse's sons. And said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature because I have refused him. Now God's having to give the prophet a little lesson on prophecy. He says, don't look at outer stuff. I don't look at that. I don't look at externals. Well, that's all people look at. We look at what you do or what you did and we evaluate you. 
God said, I do just the opposite. He said, I pay no attention to what you do or you did, and I look upon the heart. I have refused him. Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Verse nine. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by and he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. Verse 11. And Samuel said to Jesse, are all the young men here? He says, this all the sons you got. God sent me down here to anoint a king and you've sent your seven sons before me and I, none of these have been chosen. Something's off here. Then he said, there remains yet the youngest. He's keeping the sheep. Now notice something. The only one busy was the only one that was chosen. I'll just let you take that word. Yeah, I don't, I don't do well with apathetic people. Come on, somebody. I don't do well with lazy people. Why? Because the only one that was active was the one that he wanted. Yeah, I got seven sons here ain't doing nothing. But I got one out here who's working his behind off. Let me see him. He said, there remains the youngest. He's keeping sheep. Samuel said, send and bring him. For we will not sit down till he comes here. Verse 12. So he sent and brought him. Now he was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him in the midst of his brothers. <laughs> ah, God's going to take the people that are jealous of you and anoint you right in front of them and make them watch it. God's something. God will take all your haters and pour oil on, oil on you and make them stand there and watch the show. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward to Samuel Rose and went back to him. Now he's a 12 year old boy. He was anointed to be a king, but he's got to go back and keep sheep. Can you have a great anointing and still do a simple task? Can you be one of the Bay Area's billionaires but still stand at a church door and greet people with a smile on your face? So Father, bless the reading of your word in Jesus' name and everybody said amen and amen. Tell your neighbor, here we go, neighbor, here we go. <laughs> Give me a few minutes to work on this thing. I'm excited about it as if you can't, as if you can't tell. Uh, there were several things. I'm not sure uh, how far Pastor Matt got, but there were several things I was trying to get communicated last week. And uh, one of the things I wanted to communicate before I start praying about prayers, there's prayers of faith. There's prayers of deliverance. There's prayers of healings. There's prayers for miracles. There's prayers that move mountains. There's declar declaratory prayers. There's prayers of petition, prayers of thanksgiving, prayers of supplication. I got all kinds of stuff I got to teach. But before I got into actually the kinds of prayers, I wanted to take two or three weeks and talk about the heart posture. There is a way to approach God. You got to know what the room is when you walk into it and how to approach whoever that is. <laughs> okay? I've been in the rooms of governors. I've been in the rooms of senators. I've been in the rooms of two presidents. There's a way you approach people. There is a way to approach God. You don't approach God with grumblings and gripes and complaints. You enter his gates with thanksgiving. I don't believe if you can't start with a thank you, I don't even know if you're heard. Then you enter his courts with praise. Then you got to tell him how great he is. So you thank him for his goodness. You tell him, and it's hard to do that when you're mad. It's hard to do that when you think you've been slighted. It's hard to do that when you're offended. So just the very posture of having to come before Jesus with thanksgiving automatically changes your heart because it's hard to be offended and thankful at the same time. So he'll take your heart to all the good things he's done and get it away from the one thing you're complaining about. Hallelujah. You enter his gates with thanksgiving. You enter his courts with praise. I could go on further, but that's not where I am right now. I just want to let you know there's a protocol and there's a heart posture. The three things I wanted to get across last week is number one, when Revelation chapter one and chapter five, the Bible says that God has called us to be a kingdom of priests. The kingdom of priests message means that we are all intercessors. What are intercessors? Very plainly put, an intercessor is when they know what God wants and they see what is. They know what God wants. 
They see what it is and they let their prayers be the bridge where one crosses over to the other. So in other words, what God what is and what God wants, you may be the only thing standing between the two. And you've got to pray until the gap is closed and you have become the bridge where the sick become the healed. Come on, somebody. Where the bound become the delivered. Where the household that is lost becomes the household that is saved. Where the economy that is lacking becomes the economy that is prosperous. Hallelujah. That's what your prayers become. So it means we have been made a people of prayer, a people of intercession. What does that mean? That means you have been qualified by the blood of Jesus to stand in the presence of God and make your petitions known. We're supposed to pray. I got so much. Help me, Jesus. I got so much. We're supposed to pray to the Father, but we can only come to him through the Son because he's the only mediator between God and man. So I come to God, but I come in Jesus' name. I don't come in my name. You don't bust up in the courtroom door and just say, hey, God. I wish I had some Old Testament time where I could show you what happened when you walk into the king's courtroom without proper protocol. We come to God. The Bible says, start off your prayer, our Father, which art in heaven. Come to this whole thing out of relationship. Don't come out of a religion. Come out of a relationship. He's Number one, he's your father. Yes, he's a mighty God and a wise judge, but he's your father. And you are his son. And you have access to the courtroom. You have access to the father's presence. And you have access to everything the father has. By virtue of being a son. I need an amen every once in a while. Okay. Yeah, just every once in a while. Throw me one every once in a while. Hallelujah. I know it's just so good. You're just sitting there processing it. I know. Okay, okay. That's what I choose to believe anyway. <clears throat> See, I get cutting up with y'all and I lose my train of thought every time I do that. He's called us to be a kingdom of priests. We enter the presence of God as our heavenly father in the name of his son, Jesus, because I'm hidden in Christ. So when Christ enters his presence, I'm in him. Oh, so, 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 so much. Now, the second thing is that Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. God has had three houses. God has had three houses. There are three places in the earth God has lived. In the Old Testament, it was the tabernacle. When he pulled Israel out of Egypt, I know, I know people don't like tithes and offerings, but the first thing God did with a band of slaves is took up an offering. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. He said, build me a tabernacle so I may meet with you. God's desire was not just to get them away from Pharaoh. God's desire was to get them alone so he could meet with them. And so they brought their offerings to the Lord and they made the tabernacle and God dwelt on the other side of the curtain in the Holy of Holies. They couldn't but one man go in there, the high priest, and he could go in, only go in one time a year. And if he wasn't ceremonially perfect, he couldn't go in. Why? There was no Jesus. Jesus had not come yet. He was a shadow. The high priest was a shadow of what was to come, which Jesus, who's the perfect high priest. Okay, stay with me. So God moved from there to Jesus. The Bible says that in Jesus was the fullness of the Godhead in a body. So God, remember when Jesus died, the temple curtain was rent in two? God no longer lived behind that curtain. God lived in his son, Jesus. But Jesus didn't stay. He went back to the Father. Okay? And now the Bible says we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And God dwells inside of us. That is true up until this day. And God says, where I live, that place will be a house of prayer. He said, I'm not going to live in something that will not communicate with me. My house will be called a house of prayer. Now, the Bible says that our prayers are heard. Third thing I want to tell you from last week, and then I go further. Because of reverent submission. A heart that is postured rightly before God. So another thing to be heard, I can't just say the right things. I've got to posture my heart in the right area 
And this is what segues into what I want to teach to you today. 1 Samuel 16, God looks at the heart. Three quick verses. Psalm 139. Throw it up there real quick, these next three and ten. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. Jeremiah 17 and verse 10. I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doing. So God will offend your mind to move your heart. So hopefully today I'm offending your mind. Oh, we live in a non-offensive culture. No, the word of God will offend you to move you. If God wants to move you from B to C, he's got to make you hate B. So God will speak to B and renounce it so that he can put you on the C, amen? Because when you've had it bad, you gotta be careful because you'll hang out at good thinking it's great. And God knows there's more for you, but you are all right at B because it's better than anything you've ever had. But God said, this ain't my stopping place. Now, because you've fallen in love with it, I gotta gotta make you hate this so that I can move you on to the next thing. So he tests the mind so that he can move the heart. Next verse right here. Ooh, I like that. Romans 8 and 27. He who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is. Search me, know my heart. God doesn't look at outward appearances. God looks upon the heart. God does not see as man sees. Man sees externals. God looks at the heart. Then he says, not only that, he says, I test the mind and I move the heart. Over and over and over again, God is trying to tell us that the visual that he gets when he looks at someone in the earth is he looks first at their heart. Why? Because people can trick you with behavior. I can walk in this building and be a heathen and I can come in here for 90 minutes and act like the rest of you. (laughs) I can dress like you. I can learn your songs. I can hear the things you say. I'm blessed and highly favored. I can learn that when I'm walking in there. I'm blessed and highly favored. I'm, I'm, yeah, how you doing? I'm blessed and I can learn all that. Behavior tricks people. Conduct tricks people. Have you ever been deceived? What was you deceived by? You was deceived by what you saw. And what is was not what you saw because they presented something else to you. That's why you gotta be careful when you start dating somebody, especially you ladies, listen to me ladies. When you date somebody, you're not dating him, you're dating his representative. He doesn't send himself out the door, he sends out his rep. So you got to hang around long enough to get back past his rep. Come on, somebody. I, I lost my amen right there. Men saying, you blowing my cover, pastor. Come on. <laughs> man does not, God does not see as man sees God looks upon the heart. Let me go, let me go further right here. Now, religious people. In the Bible, the worst of their kind was called Pharisees. Can I be honest with you? Jesus scorched them. Those of you that look down on people's behavior who ain't got it all together, let me tell you something. Jesus welcomed those people. In fact, the Bible called Jesus the friend of sinners. Listen, that's why religious people hated him. Does he know who's touching him? Well, if he knew who the, what kind of woman this was, he'd never let him. He went home to eat with Zacchaeus. Why does he go home and eat with sinners? Jesus, the friend of sinners. And it was the Pharisees that put him on the cross. Let me tell you something. Sin put him on the cross, but so did religion. The word religion means to conform to an outer code. So please, when you share your faith, don't talk about it as another religion. Everything outside of Christ is religion. Because every other religion has a book and every other religion has a code. But none of them died for you. And none of them raised on the third day. And none of them can take your sin away. (laughs) Now, they can teach you behavior, but Christianity is not a behavior modification course. This is not here where we come together once a week to learn how to change our behavior. God changes the heart because if you change the heart, behavior is on the way to change very soon. 
and only God can change the human heart. Come on, somebody. God says, I work in, that's why the Bible says to work out, work out, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Because salvation does not start at conduct and work its way to the heart. It starts at the heart and then eventually will work all its way out to the conduct and the behavior. The Bible says, John 14 and verse 1, excuse me, Romans 14 and 1, except those who have weak faith and do not pass judgment on disputable matters. There are people in this room that are in all different seasons of their faith. There's some of you been saved 40 years or some of you got saved a little while ago. And you know what? The people who got saved 40 years ain't got it all together. And the people who got saved 30 minutes ago ain't got it all together. And it's not up to me to judge because I don't have all the information. I don't know why you do what you do. I don't know how you ended up where you ended up. I don't know why you feel like you feel. I don't know your hurts. I don't know your abuses. I don't know your divorce. I don't know your story. I don't know it. But God knows all about it and he's the only mighty wise judge. Judge not that you be not judged for in the same measure you use it will be measured back to you. Somebody shout amen. Shout I'm not religious. <laughs> so religion means when I tell you the church that I grew up in, who I go, always going, I'm always going to tell you this, whom I love dearly. I'm grateful. I have a very rich heritage, very rich. <laughs> but I was raised in what they called the holiness church. Holiness to them was getting all the things right. So it looked like an impossible life to me, especially a guy who had problems. I don't know about y'all. When I came to Jesus, I had problems. I know y'all were glowing in the dark when y'all came to Jesus. <laughs> But I, I heard all these rules all the time. And finally, after a little while, I said, I can't do all this. They had a, they had a teaching. They call save, sanctify, fill the Holy Ghost. That's what they say, save, sanctify, fill the Holy Ghost. So after you get saved, they, they had another, and I, I, I alone broke this whole doctrine. Just me, I proved this, this doctrine was false, just me. They said that there was a second experience you have with God called total eradication of the sin nature, sanctification. And so you go down the next time and ask to be sanctified, and when you got up, you're supposed to not want to sin anymore. <laughs> that didn't work on me, I, I don't know. I hadn't been out of the altar 15 minutes, and I can't tell you some of the thoughts that's going through my head when I saw that. A young girl walk up the aisle and saw her pretty little ankles. Come on, somebody. I did. Man, her ankles are pretty. Hallelujah. <laughs> and so that understood you have to work out your salvation. It's a work. It's a work in progress. It's a work in the word. It's a work at confronting yourself. I talked to my staff in the staff meetings last week from both coast and all of our iChurch staff who lives all over America. We, I talked to all of them. I talked about being self-aware, being a self-aware leader. A self-aware leader is somebody that has honest conversations with themselves so nobody else has to. <laughs> I talked about knowing your dominant strengths but also knowing your dominant weaknesses knowing what you bring to the table and knowing what you're not good at and what you're not good at, quit, quit asking to do it. Yes. People who can't sing, but they're determined to be on the praise team. <laughs> you need to go do something. We need you in the coffee bar. Come on, somebody. I don't need you up there making some noise to, to the Lord. <clears throat> okay. Here again, I lost my train of thought. I got to cutting up with you. Help me get back on track here, God. Okay, yeah, religious people. <laughs> Let me make sure I'm in, preaching anywhere close to the notes that I've prepared today. Yep. Go to Hebrews 4. Hebrews 4 and 12. I gotta, yeah, I gotta make wise of my time here. Give me just a few minutes. We're talking about a heart that is postured right before God. 
Samuel, I look at the heart. Search me, know my heart. I search the heart, I test the mind. He who knows the, the he who searches the hearts knows the mind. Is, I gave you four scriptures, boom, 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 boom. Everything about God looking at the heart. Now, how do we fix our heart? For the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing, even the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Hmm. So a heart that is postured right before God has to be a heart that is constantly holding the word up as a mirror. Okay, let me explain that and I'll start landing this plane. Holding the word up as a mirror. The word pierces even to the division of soul and spirit. That's the hardest thing to discern because many times we think they're one and the same. Your soul has to do with your feelings. What is the first thing we say about God? Well, I feel like God. Well, I feel like God wanted me to tell you. Well, I feel like God wanted me to give you this. And, and God's not a feeling. <laughs> feelings can accompany God. I have all kinds of feelings in the presence of God, but God is not a feeling. There's been many things that I felt like doing and God was nowhere <laughs> near it. <laughs> so suffice it to say, feelings are liars. But the Bible says you will think one is the other if you're never in the word. Because the word of God will help you divide what's coming from my soul, my mind, my will, and my, and where is the Holy Spirit speaking to me? That's powerful right there. It pierces the fine, razor-thin line between the two and lets you know where did that feeling, where did that thought originate? Did it come out of me or did it come out of my spirit? And then it says it divides joints and marrow. It's not talking about your body. The Bible says in the body of Christ, you know, God likens the church the body of Christ like a physical body. He gives the analogy in Romans 12. A joint, the Bible says every joint supplies. Okay? So every relationship I have is a supply. Yeah. If I'm joined with him, there's something he's supplying me with. Yeah. That's why you got to watch your joints. Because <laughs> you're getting something from them whether you think you are or not. That's why the Bible says bad company corrupts good character. It didn't say your good character will change the company. <laughs> Pastor all up in my stuff today. Pastor all up in my stuff. <laughs> Every relationship I have is a supply. Some of you are getting nothing but a supply of drama. Some of you are getting nothing but a supply of toxins. Some of you are getting nothing but a supply of negativity. Some of you are getting nothing but a supply of doubt and cynicism. You got to watch your relationships and what supply do they bring? Every joint supplies. Okay? So that word joint means things that, and people that are assigned to you. The word marrow, it's not talking about bone marrow. It means people that are attached to you. So the word of God will pierce the line between what's a feeling and what's God. And then it'll even get in my relationships and say, these people are assigned to you, but these people are attached to you. <laughs> Boy, this is good preaching, ain't it? 
it amazing that truth supersedes all seasons, all times, all generations, and all cultures? What we're reading was penned 2,000 years ago, and he's right in our closet cleaning it out right here in 2022. (laughs) So it's impossible to be in the Word constantly and your heart not be constantly moved, changed, and tested. If I have to approach God with the right heart because he searches the heart. When you come into the presence of God, he's not looking at what you're wearing. He's not looking at what you're saying. He's not even looking at what you're doing. But he's looking how you postured yourself. The right heart means everything to me, especially if I'm choosing staff people. I can deal with inconsistencies. I've even at times dealt with incompetency, but I cannot deal with somebody who is rotten in their core. (laughs) And there are many people that have the right heart, but the wrong head. And I'm convinced the head is much easier to change than the heart. So if you've got the right heart, I'll train your head. But you've got to have the right heart. Because only God can fix that. So I don't have time to spend my wheels in futility trying to fix something that I can't fix. So now, last verse. We close on this one. I know I have about three closings, but y'all have gotten to know me by now. Hallelujah. Oh, I got so much. I don't want to skip it. James 4. I I can't do that. I can't open that right now. James 4 is too good. I may have to take all week on James 4 next week. Let me just, can I read it? (laughs) Let me read it, and I'm not going to say anything. (laughs) Not going to say anything. I'm going to be disciplined. But this is the one I I was trying to preach myself to, and I've spent 35, 38 minutes just, and I ain't got there yet. This is so good. Where do wars and fights come from? Well, I'd like that answered. Why are you in always sideways with somebody? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in you? Next verse, you lust, but you don't have. He said, you always set your heart on it, but it always slips through your fingers. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. Verse three, you ask and you don't receive. Okay, that's what's wrong with everybody's praying right there. That's why we don't do it. Because I did it and I didn't see any, I didn't see any results, so why, why waste my time? You ask and you don't receive. Why? Because you ask amiss. That means with wrong motive. Where are motives? Here again, I'm going back to the heart. He says, you come up in my face and you ask for things, but these things do not arise out of the Spirit of God. They arise out of your own desires. What does the Word do? It pierces between what you want and what God wants. And he says, the reason you don't receive is because you ask with the wrong motive that you may spend it on your own pleasures. Verse four, this is so good. Adulterers and adulteresses. He's not talking about people being unfaithful in their marriage. He's talking about people who are operating out of their own desires. He said, you cheating on me. He said, I put my spirit in you so that you could follow my spirit so that he can lead you, not because you can do whatever you want to do. And he says, you are cheating on me when you follow what you want instead of following what I want. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whatever, whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself the enemy of God. Verse 5. Do you not think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in you yearns jealousy, jealously. The Holy Spirit is having to sit there on the inside of you and watch you sabotage your life because you won't listen to him. Can you imagine how frustrating that is for the Holy Spirit? So verse five, I mean verse six and I'll quit. But he gives grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud. Where is pride and humility? God resists the I'll do it my way. But he cannot resist the 
not my will, but your will be done. Put your hands together if you would, please, all over this building. Can we stand together? Uh, look at your neighbor and say, he was talking straight to you. <laughs> it's my desire that always you being here at this worship gathering makes your day and makes your week better. My Sundays are better because I get to be with you a little while. And thank you for taking an hour and a half, two hours out of your week and giving it to God like this. This is the first day of the week. You know what you just did? You just gave God the tithe. This is the first day of the week and I'm going to give it to God. Woo! So God will honor that. Can I bless you before you go? May the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. May he establish you and give you peace in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Meet a friend on the way out. Go look at the merchandise and be a walking billboard. We'll see you next week. <laughs>